Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. All right, Phenomenology of Perception. So we're still in video 13, still, kind of. Um, there's there's going to be one more after this too, I think. I'm going to do three for this, this section. Anyway, part two, The Perceived World. Um, and we're in space. The, the chapter is called Space. And this, this video is going to be about movement. Right, so Merleau-Ponty says, as soon as we analyse movement, it disappears. <clears throat> what does he mean by that? The moving object, the object that's moving, doesn't actually change, right? The object is, is the same throughout the movement. So what changes then? The relations of the object to external objects. So that's what changes in movement. And that means that movement, which is those changing relations, and the moving object, are different they're separate they're able to be separated and that means the moving object doesn't move and that gives us Zeno's paradox so as soon as we analyze movement as soon as we break down movement into um, this abstracted artificial um, concept we lose that sense of movement and that's not going to work. That's not going to work for us. Because we do perceive movement. So we need to preserve that somehow. We can't we can't write it off as an illusion because that, that just I mean, phenomenology of perception, we're describing perception. It's no good to then say, Oh, that perception's an illusion, so we don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> the perception is what it is, so we have to describe it. So how Malo Pond is gonna endeavour to do this is by starting with a, um, a thought experiment or an example. Imagine you've got a piece of paper, you've got a reference point, a mark, say in the middle of the page, and you move a pencil across that paper. So if you move it across quickly enough, um, you'll never be aware of the moment that the pencil is above that reference mark. You're, it's, it's just happening too fast. right? You're not aware, explicitly aware, of the pencil ever being directly above that that the reference mark on the page um, and the idea with that the idea that Milo Bond is getting at is that we don't see in movement we don't see any of the individual intermediary stages we don't see the pencil here then here then here then above the reference mark then there then there then there all we see is maybe like a blur. There's a blur, a coloured blur flashing across space, right, through space. If we slow the pencil down enough so that we can, we can explicitly see the detail, see the pencil itself, see the pencil itself not changing, then we can, then, we, then we'll identify a point. Yes, the pencil's above the reference mark there and we can keep going. But then the, the sense of movement that Malo Ponte is trying to grasp disappears. <clears throat> so there's two kind of ways to look at that. Slow the, slow the pencil down enough, sense of motion disappears. Speed it up, and we don't get any of those. We, we, can't, we don't perceive explicitly any of the intermediary stages that the pencil goes through in its movement. So the idea here then, Malo Ponte will say, is... To, uh, he'll say that to move is not to pass through an indefinite series of positions successively. This object is only given as beginning, carrying out, or completing its movement. Consequently, even in cases where a mobile object is visible, the movement is not for it an extrinsic denomination, nor a relation between itself and the exterior, and we will be able to have movements without reference points. Finally, since movement is no longer a system of relations external to the moving object itself, nothing prevents us now from acknowledging absolute movements as perception actually gives it to us at each moment. Okay, so there's quite a bit in that quote. Um, I'll just highlight the parts, the different parts of that. First, movement isn't a relation of a thing to the external environment. Or first, actually, it's not a movement. It's not. It's not moving through definite positions successively. So that's the first thing to note. 
Second thing is um, it's not a relation um, of the thing to other objects in its environment because it's not we're not breaking it down into kind of frame by frame analysis. So movement isn't a relation to external objects. All that we see in movement, all that we apprehend in movement is the object at the beginning, the object through the movement and the object at the end. So the, the, that, that portion where the object is actually moving is kind of taken as a whole. We, don't, we can't break that down into further steps. Why? Because that's not what we're perceiving. That's not, what, that's not how the object is given to us. It's given to us as this indistinct blur flashing across the page. It's not given to us at each individual point. It's given to us at the beginning. It's given to us as this blur moving through space. And it's given to us at the end. Um, so movements without reference points. Since we're describing movement without reference points, what we're getting is an absolute movement, the move, a movement of the thing, the object itself, without reference to, to other objects, without relation being posited with other objects. So movement is grasped as a whole. That's what I was saying. Through the movement, we have, we have to take that as, as kind of one whole absolute, that that's all we get from it. That's what is given to us, not this kind of breakdown of a relation between external objects. Um, so I think that's pretty pretty clear. I, I did think of an analogy, which I hope doesn't make things more confusing. But um, if you have a series of static pictures and flick through them fast enough, the objects on the the, the pictures, the objects in the pictures will appear to move, right? Oh, those old flip books or something. Um, now, what's happening there is, are we seeing the image move? Well, yes, there's movement there. We are seeing the image move. But what is happening is, all that's happening is static. A series of static images are being shown successively so fast that we don't see the gap between them, right? That's all that's happening <clears throat> if we break it down. But we can't break it down like that. We think that when we're breaking it down like that, we're getting to the truth. We're getting to what's really happening. But actually, we're covering over our perception in doing that. We're, we're missing the perception of movement and, 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 and kind of writing it off as an illusion created by the speed at which the, the images are flicking through. And we can't think of it like that. The, the images on the, on the, 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 uh, the, the picture that we're flicking through are moving. We are sensing movement. We're perceiving movement. And that, we have to take that as genuine. That is genuine movement. Um, like I said, we're describing what we perceive. And if you're, if you're a little hesitant about taking that, if you don't accept that, you're going to end up in Zeno's paradox because ultimately the same thing can be said about movement in the real world, right? Movement in the real world is nothing more than a series of static images hitting your, your retina, being interpreted by your brain. You're getting, you're getting slices, discrete slices of reality moment by moment, they're just being strung together by your brain in such a way that you can't tell the difference. You can't see the individual slices. And then, I mean, that's Zeno's paradox, movement's an illusion. But, but if, if you, if you um, take the, that idea of the, the flip book, if there's no movement there, then it's the same thing in reality. There's no movement here either. But that's not going to work. It's not, it's not an adequate description of, of experience. We're not describing what we perceive anymore. We're describing, we're trying to describe um, an objective thing without a perceiver. We're trying to describe what happens without a subject. 
and that's the, the antithesis of the whole phenomenological project, the whole existential idea. There has to be that subject. That's what we're trying to discover. That, discover. That's what we're trying to, to flesh out is what it means to exist, what it means to perceive, what it means to experience. Um, so if we experience movement, if we perceive movement, that's movement, and we have to describe it as such, as, as we experience it, as we perceive it, not not try and break it down further. Because if we do that, the movement disappears. There is no movement, and it's Zeno's paradox. So, um, okay, let me get back on track. That's our dis the, that's our breakdown of movement. It's not a it's not a relation. It's it's an absolute. Um, we grasp the object at the beginning as a, as a total, as a, as a whole during the movement and at the end. Okay, Malai Ponti goes on to talk about <clears throat> two, two different positions regarding movement. The first is that of, of the logician. And the logician, he says, sees the explicit identity of the moving object, but then can't see the dynamic phenomenon. So they, they see, they break the object down into, you know, they can, they, they can grasp it explicitly in detail. But then if you, if, you, if you approach it, if you analyze it like that, you lose that sense of movement. We talked about that already. The other position is the psychologist's position, where they have a concrete description of a moving object. So they, they grasp the, the object in motion um, as as a kind of real world phenomenon, but that then then they have to acknowledge that the object there's there's a moving object here. So there's something more to the object than um, a series of static pictures. So the way that the psychologist um, chooses to describe the object in motion means that. They're forced to, to acknowledge that the object itself is moving rather than relations to, rather than movement being a change in relations to external objects. So what Malai Ponti wants to say about this is the perception of movement is not secondary in relation to the perception of the moving object. That one does not have a perception of the moving object here, then there, and subsequently an identification that would connect these positions in succession. That their diversity is not subsumed under a transcendent unity. And finally, that the identity of the moving object bursts forth directly from experience. So kind of summarizing most of what, what I've been saying already, um, we don't have the, the moving object first in a breakdown. Um, so that, first of all, we, that, that's the first thing to note. But there isn't the moving object and then kind of this, then a secondary realization that the object is moving. We get the moving object as a whole up front, immediately. We don't see it position by position, step by step, and then kind of have to synthesize these steps in order to appreciate movement, again, we get the movement as a whole at the at the very beginning. Um, Red hmm, that's strange. And then uh, the identity of the moving object bursts forth directly from experience. So experience just gives us this moving object directly. There's no um, calculation, there's no, there's no intellectual synthesizing required here. <clears throat> and that means that Malot Ponty wants to describe or break objects down into two categories. So there are two types of objects. There's the movable object, which is the object of explicit perceptions. This is an object that has explicit properties that we can assign to it. Um, and so this is the logician's object, the object that we can look at, see it has a certain color, see it has a certain size, um, and a certain shape, and, and all of those other, proper, any other properties we might want to assign to it. 
that's the movable object, we also have a moving object. And the moving object has no properties. Like I said, when we're moving that pencil across the page, it's not, it doesn't have a, 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 um, an explicit color, specific color. It, it's a kind of blur. It's a color, colored, colored thing. It's a colored blur, not, not, a, not an explicit, definite yellow or whatever color the, the pencil is. It's not a, an explicit size. It, it has size, and we can see it has size, but we can't measure it. And if we try, we won't be able to. It doesn't have a shape either. It has a, an indistinct form because it's moving. So the Merleau-Ponty describes this as the moving object having a style rather than properties, rather than explicit, definite properties. Um, and so really what Merleau-Ponty is saying here is that an object in motion is different from an object at rest. A moving object is different from a movable object. But of course all movable objects can be moving objects if they, if they um, are moving. Um, and so I've written this, movement perceives, yeah, movement perceives something that moves rather than something definite, a colored something, but without actual color. And in general, when, when we're talking about movement, the perceptions are all pre-logical and non-thetic. Because it's, it's again, it's, there's, we're unable to, to lock the object down in any way. We can see it's moving, but that movement gives it this, this kind of amorphous quality. Um, and that, that's a general thing too, actually, uh, um, a general point. And all perceptions are, are pre-logical and non-thetic originally. That's originally what they are, even without movement, even without considering movement. And um, Malai Pondi gives the example of a perceived circle, which he says cannot have unequal diameters. Obviously, all the diameters must be the same. But it also can't have equal diameters. So no, it doesn't have unequal diameters, doesn't have equal diameters. What's going on? It has no diameters at all. This is the perceived circle. Right? So the perceived circle has no diameters. Rather, it is what it is, a circle, by virtue of its circular physiognomy. It looks like a circle. It has, it has the shape of a circle. But it doesn't have these explicit properties. Diameter, radius arcs you know those things all come from an analysis an intellectual analysis later that consciousness provides um, and so that, that's the the general point perception in general lacks these we don't see when we see a circle we don't see an object with equal diameters we just see a circle we can break it down, we can analyze it and see that yeah, the, the diameters are equal. But then we've gone beyond the original perception. Right? And so that, that's what Malay Pondi is getting at. And it's the same with movement. The, the thing that moves, the thing in motion, doesn't have these objective properties. It, it has ambiguous qualities. Um, so, cool. Let me keep going. Movement is prior to the world of the logician. It's in the phenomenon. So this is the phenomenon. And he gives a nice description here um, of the phenomenal world, the non-thematic world, as surrounding being. The thematic. Um, the thematic world. So the, this ambiguous, amorphous, unclear, indefinite um, phenomenal world surrounds the world of the of surrounds being itself surrounds the the world of of the the analytic and we can we can get to that analysis we can we can break it down but we have to go through that phenomenal world first so that's what that's what perception that's what my point is looking to uncover with perception so he has a nice quote too Movement is a modulation of an already familiar milieu, 
and it brings us back once again to our central problem, which is to understand how this milieu, which serves as the background of every act of consciousness, is constituted. Cool. That's the task. That's the goal. That's what this whole book's about. All right, then Malo Pondi goes on to talk about relative motion a little bit. So relative motion, um, this is basically the scientific approach, understanding of motion, the physicist's approach. And essentially what it does is deny a subjective perspective, right? <clears throat> so we've got two objects, A and B. Um, which one's moving? Well, for the, for the scientists, the question really doesn't make sense. Is A moving in relation to B or is B moving in relation to A? All we can say from a scientific perspective is that there is movement between A and B in relation to A and B. Um, and and this, you know, this, is, this is one of the consequences of, of treating the world in this objective fashion. Um, motion is relative. For science it doesn't matter the math works either way whether a is moving or whether b is moving and in fact and if, if you take the math seriously which physicists do um it, it's true that there is no sense in which a is moving and b is stationary or b is moving and a is stationary all that we can say the physicist will tell us is that there is motion a is moving relative to B, or B is moving relative to A. They're the same. There's no there's no sense in which um, one gets kind of priority, privilege over another, over another object. But that's exactly what we want in phenomenology. We're talking about we're 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 bringing the subject back into the description of the world, right? And so for for. for the phenomenologist, every movable object appears in a field, in a background, on a background, right? And there's that double horizon again that we've talked about, figure background. And which part of the field we take up as figure determines which is then seen as moving, which object is the moving object. And so for the phenomenologist, there is a moving object, and it does matter, and it does make sense to talk about a moving object because that's what we perceive that's what we that's how we um experience the world we we never experience it from this kind of god's eye view where we're not involved we're always involved we're always in the middle <clears throat> of we're always in the middle of the world we're, I, I like to say we've, we've got it all over us already as soon as we're we're trying to think about movement as soon as we as soon as it even the idea occurs to us, it's too late. We're already in the world. It's already all over us. You know, we're, we're stuck with the perspective. Um, and, and so we're just trying to, to capture that. We're trying to describe it and explain it and understand it, not explain it away, not get rid of it. That's, that's great. That's exactly what we want science to do. We want it to... Um, to, to get rid of, of any kind of perception, any bias. We want it to just be objective. That's how science is useful. <clears throat> but if we if we then start making the, the mistake of thinking that well, science tells us what's really happening and our perception is an illusion or um, wrong in some way, then, then we end up with going down a path that will end up with saying things like consciousness is an illusion you know you're not really conscious you think you are but it's it's just an illusion it's a trick played on you by, by your brain something like that <clears throat> okay so anyway i've got I've gone a little bit off track um which, which object appears as the movable object is the one that we single out as the figure um and i've got a quote for this before I give you the quote, so Malay Ponte says that movement is not relative. <clears throat> it's it's not relative. It's not a relation between objects. That's the important point to grasp. 
movement is not a relation between object A and object B. It's always grounded in a subject's hold on the world. So it, it always appears, or it can only appear, where there is a figure to a background, or where there's a background to a figure, right? But it can't appear without that. There's no, there is no movement between object A and object B. And in that sense, the physicist's right. There is no movement there. But that's what we're trying to describe. We're trying to describe movement. Um, and let me just read the quote for you. <clears throat> What gives the status moving object to one part of the visual field and the status background to another is the manner in which we establish our relations with it through the act of looking. What could the words, the stone flies through the air, mean if not that our gaze, being established and anchored in the garden, is solicited by the stone and, so to speak, pulls on its anchors? The relation between the moving object and its background passes through our body. So that's another nice, clear passage, which I think gets to the <clears throat> exactly what, what we're talking about here. Um, the thing that I did want to point out, that last sentence, the relation between the moving object and its background passes through our body. So that, that's a reference to that idea that there has to be a viewing subject for there to be movement. If we take the, the subject out, there is no movement. That makes no sense to even talk about it because there is no figure against the background. All we have are just, just objects, right? Just the in itself. And the other thing I wanted to point out is <clears throat> what Molo Ponti talks about there, this being anchored, the way that our gaze is established and anchored in the garden. When we say the stone flies through the air, what does he mean by this, 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 this idea of our gaze being anchored in the garden? Well, that, it's just the idea that the garden is the background. It's, it's what kind of remains stationary. It's what holds the scene together for me, like an anchor. And he talks about these anchorage points in a bit more detail. Um, and saying that our body becomes anchored in certain objects. And it's this which creates the relation between background and figure. So the anchorage, the, the, the anchor is the background. And it's therefore not an explicit perception. We don't explicitly perceive the background. The background appears as this fuzzy, indeterminate background on which the figure appears. And the figure appears clear for us. Unless it's moving, and then the figure is also in, in motion, and it becomes that ambiguous coloured thing rather than a yellow pencil. And the, the example that Moai Ponti gives here is um, this, a steeple, maybe a church steeple, and the sky in the background. So the sky, when we look at the sky, what we see then is um, if we imagine there are clouds in the, in the background passing, the steeple appears to be moving for us because the steeple is our, is our foreground. The sky is the background and, and is, it's not, <clears throat> we're not looking at the, the sky. We're looking at the steeple. And so if there's a sense of motion in the sky, that translates as... For, for us in perception, as the steeple moving while the sky remains stationary. <clears throat> the sky is not thematized. Okay, I just want to finish this section um, with a little discussion about the body. Right, so the, the thing I wanted to talk about, what the thing Milo Ponti talks about, is how can the body... A possible objection. How can the body as an object itself, the body is an object in the world, right, like other objects, at rest sometimes and in motion at others, how can it <clears throat> mediate motion in the way that we've described, given that it's just a body? Um, obviously, I mean, you can probably see that this is 
a flaw this already flawed the, the premise is flawed from the beginning because the body isn't an object like other objects We've, I've said that I don't know how many times um, in this video series already um, but the specific claim let's just follow it through the claim then is that objects appear not to move when we move our eyes because we take into account the movement of our eyes. So if I move my eyes to the right, <clears throat> what happens for me, my vision, is that everything moves to the left, right? But I don't, I don't experience that. I experience my eyes moving to the right. Why? Well, so, so, the, so the explanation goes, we, we recognize that we've moved our eyes through this much of an angle, or this much of, a, of a, an arc, and we compensate. It's a calculation. We're back to this intellectual analysis of perception. Something happens, we move our eyes, and then we have to factor in into our um, calculation that movement, and that, that lets us know that we're then, we're then able to factor out that movement and, and recognize that my eyes have moved, not the world. This is, as Milo Ponti says, entirely fictional. And it conceals from us the true relation of the body to the spectacle, <clears throat> the body to, the, to, our, to our surroundings. It's explicitly not a deduction or a calculation. Movement is, is not, nothing to do with this. Perception's nothing to do with this. Um, I, I've got a short quote, which I'll, I'll just read for you. My eye is, for me, a certain power for encountering things. It is not a screen upon which things are projected. And that's that idea that it's not, the body is not a thing, an object like other objects. It's a power for encountering things. It's that by which I encounter the world. <clears throat> it's not another object in the world. If we don't make that distinction, we fall into this trap of thinking that, there, that there's a problem here. How can we how can we know motion through, how can we know motion in, in objects through an object which is itself in motion? That, that's a, a flawed way of thinking about what the body is. And uh, Malai Ponte even says, moving the body is actually movement without a moving object. That's what, that when we move the body, there's movement there, but there is no moving object because the body is not an object to be moved. The body is that through which we see movement. It's through that through which we perceive objects. And so it, it's not in itself an object. The movement of my eye toward what it will focus upon is not the shifting of one object in relation to another object. It is a march toward the real. If the body provides the ground or the background to the perception of movement that perception needs to establish itself, it does so as a perceiving power, insofar as it is established in a certain domain and geared into a world. Cool. That's it, right? I think there's nothing more to say about that. That is where I'm going to finish this, this video. This is the second one. The third one, I've still got quite a bit to go through. With lived space um, if I do that today I won't make it I won't make it um, so let's take a break <clears throat> I'll come back in with a third video let me just quickly give a kind of brief summary of, of this so we've talked about movement um, it's not it's not a um, it can't be understood as a a series of steps that um, moving through space, you know, a series of discrete, um, independent steps in a progression. It's nor is it a relation to external objects. The thing itself is a moving object, is a moving and we have to we have to take that as an absolute because it's not it's no longer a relative quality. It's an absolute quality and the object moves and that means that we can distinguish between two types of objects, movable objects, 
um, which have discrete properties that we can that we can see and 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 analyze and moving objects which are fundamentally different um, they are they no longer have these properties rather they have a style a way of of being a color it's a colored thing instead of you know having explicit um, properties relative motion is not is motion isn't relative it's always grounded in a, in a perceiver um, which a perceiver who for whom um, a figure appears on a background anchored in a background okay so let me finish up there um, yeah thanks for listening hopefully this is this is coming together for you next we'll finish up this this chapter in the next video the third part of this of video 13 and um yeah thanks again i'll see you soon